Hello, welcome to a two video series where we will derive the sigma orbitals of xenon tetrafluoride using the projection operator method. Here we have a sketch of the structure of xenon tetrafluoride and we can determine using the SEPR theory uh, considerations that xenon tetrafluoride is a square planar molecule. Therefore, it belongs to the symmetry point group D4H. It is common practice to arrange planar molecules in the XY plane. So here we've labeled the X axis and the Y axis with the Z axis being perpendicular to the plane of the whiteboard. The first step in our derivation is to find the allowed linear combination of atomic orbitals on fluorine, which have the proper symmetry to interact with atomic orbitals on the central xenon atom. By convention and for simplicity, we tend to represent these sigma orbitals, uh, the atomic orbital combination on the fluorine that contributes to the overall molecular orbital using circles, which is typical for S orbitals. We could just as well have written these as P orbitals. And in fact, uh, we will know from energy considerations, but not symmetry considerations, that the relevant atomic orbitals that are involved on fluorine are going to be p orbitals and not s orbitals. Nonetheless, it just makes the representation of the uh, molecular orbitals easier if we, for simplicity, represent them as if they were s orbitals. So next, we want to label these particular atomic orbitals uh, on fluorine that will become our linear combination of atomic orbitals that's going to be involved in the overall molecular orbitals. So we'll call this first one S1, where S is for sigma, S2, S3, and then S4. Our next step after this is to generate a reducible representation for the sigma bonding in this molecule. As part of our determining the reducible representation for sigma bonding in this molecule, we construct a table that looks pretty similar to the table that we would see for the character table for the point group D4H. One slight difference that I've made here is in the case where there is only one symmetry operation in the class, this number in purple here is the number of operations in the class, and the class is found within one particular column. Typically, we omit the number one in the character table, but I put it here because later on we're going to use this particular value, and I want to show in every case by color coding exactly where this number came from. So in traditional character table, you would just see E here, but you would see 2C4, you would see C2, and then 2C2 prime, and so on. The important thing is in constructing our table, under each of these particular columns, we want to write down the number of these sigma orbitals that do not change position under the symmetry operation. So for example, under the E operation, the identity, each one of these four orbitals stays exactly where it is. So we're interested in the number that don't move, which is all of them, so this will be four. So we'll write down number four here, and again, to color code it, we're gonna write it in red, which will help us later on. Our next symmetry operation is C4. So this is the high order rotation axis for the group, and it's along this particular line. It's perpendicular to the plane of the whiteboard. So S1 would move to S2, S2 and S3, for example. For one of the C4s is going counterclockwise. The other one of the C4s is going clockwise. In both cases, all of the S orbitals will move. Therefore, none of the 
sigma orbitals here will stay put, so we put down a zero. Now, the C2 that we have here is if we do a C4 and then a C4 again. So it's a C2 operation around this particular uh, axis, the z-axis. So again, all of the uh, sigma orbitals here are going to move position, so that's going to be zero. None stays put. So now for this C2 prime, what are we talking about here? So now the C2 prime axis is along the either the x or the y axis. When we have a prime, we have multiple C2 axes, we give priority to those that go through the most atoms. So here we have a C2 axis that goes through two fluorines and a xenon, so that's our C2 prime. So along this particular axis, when we rotate, S3 and S1 will stay put, so the value here is going to be two. Notice that we get exactly the same effect if we pick our C2 prime axis to be along this one. This is the second of the C2 prime axes. And again, while S1 and S3 move now, S2 and S4 stay where they were. So we have the value of two here. So what about this C2 double prime? Well, we have a C2 axis that goes between the atoms here. That's why it's double prime and not single prime. Single prime gets priority because it goes through more atoms. So here we have this particular C2 axis. We notice that S1 would go to the S2 position, S2 would go to S1. Similarly with S3 and S4, so none of those stay in the same position after the symmetry operation. So the value here is going to be zero. Now for the inversion, inversion takes S1 to S3, S3 to S1, S2 to S4, and S4 to S2. So all of the orbitals will change position, so therefore, the value here is S, zero. So the S4 operation is an improper rotation that has a C4 followed by a mirror in the plane of the whiteboard. So as soon as we do the C4 part of the operation, all of the orbitals are going to move. So we get the exact same value that we get for the C4 here, and this is going to be zero. Sigma H is a mirror in the plane of the whiteboard that takes S1 into S1, S2 into S2, and so on. So all the orbitals get reflected into themselves. So again, they all stay where they were. So now the value here is going to be four. Our character for this particular class is going to be four. Sigma V, so when we have our mirror planes, the vertical mirror is going to be the one, just like the C2 prime, the one that goes through the most atoms here. That isn't already the, the uh, horizontal mirror. So our sigma v is the mirror plane going either along the x-axis or along the y-axis. So again, this is going to keep two of the orbitals in position and swap the other two. So our character here is going to be a2. And then for the last symmetry operation in the group, we have our dihedral mirror. So dihedral mirror is a lower priority because it goes through fewer atoms than the sigma v. So sigma v is here, sigma d is here, all of the orbitals are going to change position, therefore none of them stays put, so our character here is going to be a zero. Next, we need to reduce our reducible representation, which we generated here, into a linear combination of irreducible representations, which will give us information about the sigma bonding in xenon tetrafluoride. So we have a somewhat complicated algorithm to reduce our reducible representation. We need to go through the uh, character table of the point group D4H and look at each one of the irreducible representations. Starting one by one, the first is the totally symmetric representation A1G. And to figure out how many A1Gs are found in this reducible representation, first we need to divide our uh, computation by the number of operations in the group. So if we add up the number of operations in the point group D4H, we see that there are 16 operations. So we always have this one over 16 for the rest of the combination. Then we notice that we have a series of terms and we only have terms for the entries in our table that are non-zero. So we notice we have a four here, a two, a four, and a two. So 
We could go through every single class, but since many of the classes are zero, we know that if we multiply anything by zero, we get zero anyway. So to spend time on those is simply a waste of time. So we only need to really worry about the non-zero entries. So in each of these terms, we have three factors. The first factor is the character that we have in our table, this four here. So it's color coded to be in red. The second factor is going to be the number of operations in the class. So that's why we went to the trouble of actually writing the one in here so we could see the purple one is this. And this last one we get from the character table for D4H. So you have to look up the character table either online or in your textbook to see the particular entries. Um, even if we didn't have the character table for D4H, knowing that this is the totally symmetric representation, that is the representation that has all ones as the characters. Anyway, so this is the term that we get for the E operation. Now, the next non-zero one is the C2 prime. So this is the term corresponding to C2 prime. We have a character of two, which is a red. We have, ooh, I wrote it down wrong. So we have two operations in the in the class, so this has to be a two. That's an advantage of color coding it. I can see that right away. And then our character from the character table is a one. For our third term here, we're looking at the sigma h. So we have four as our reduce our character. It's in red. We have one operation in the class, so that's our purple one, and our black one is from the character table for D4H. And our last combination here, again, showing you the advantages of color coding this, D2 is red. That's our character here. We have the number of operations in the class, which is two. So we have our two purple. And then one is from the character table for D4H. So in this we have four, 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 four is 16. One divided by 16 is equal to one. What this tells us is that in this reducible representation, there's exactly one and only one A1G linear combination. Important things about the number that we get when we do this computation. The number can never be negative and the number can never be not an integer. So if you ever get a fraction here, you've made a mistake. If you ever get a negative number, you've made a mistake. So this number will either be zero or some positive integer. And then we have to continue through each and every irreducible representation in the group to find the uh, linear combination that is incorporated inside this reducible representation. Now, we're going to find figure out something else that will simplify our work, which is that since we have four group orbitals here, we're going to have four and exactly four um, irreducible representations that are stored in our reducible representation. So once we find those four, we know that all the rest will end up having to be zero, so we can stop at that point. Our next irreducible representation in the point group D4H is A2G. So we proceed exactly as we did for A1G, and we'll notice another labor-saving device, that the first two factors in each of these terms, the four and the one, for example, here, and the two and the two, four and one, two, two, will be exactly the same for every single term that we write down. For every single irreducible representation, the first two factors will be exactly the same. The only one that can possibly change is the third because this is from the character table for D4H, and depending upon which irreducible representation we have, we may get different characters. So we see that in the first case, we still have four times one times one, because the character for the identity operation for A2G is also A1. But then when we get to the second, when we get to our C2 prime, instead of having a positive one, now for A2G we have a minus one as the character. So then we proceed here, and then we see we have another minus one. Very important thing is, no matter how you write these out, be very careful how you uh, put down your minus sign, because if you mess up the minus signs, you will end up getting a negative value, perhaps, or a fraction, and you'll drive yourself crazy. So if you write yourself legibly, perhaps even more legibly than I've done here, you will save yourself a lot of aggravation. So I notice here we have 
positive 4, minus 4, positive 4, minus 4. So this particular example gives us that we have no A2Gs in this reducible representation. Our next irreducible representation is B1G, and we continue exactly as we had before. And what is often a convenient thing to do on your paper is to make small annotations as to which of the symmetry operations that you're including. Remember, we omitted the symmetry operations where the character was a zero. And writing this down makes it easier for us when we're consulting the character table for our point group, in this case, D4H, to make sure that we're writing down the correct value for the character. So we continue here, we see that all these terms inside the uh, brackets equals 16. One divided by 16 is equal to one. So, so far we know that inside the reducible representation, we have one A1G and one B1G. So we know that there have to be four, so we have to continue this process. Next, we have the irreducible representation B2G, and we continue exactly as we had before. And we notice now that instead of having all ones here, we have ones and minus ones as our characters. And the result is that when we divide through, we get a value of zero. So this tells us that there are no B2G irreducible representations in the linear combination that makes up the reducible representation for sigma bonding. Since we've only found two so far and we need four, we have to continue. We continue our reduction process and to save you some boredom, I'm just gonna tell you that when you do that, for all the irreducible representations from EG all the way to BTU, they all end up being equal to zero, which means that they do not contribute to the reducible representation for sigma bonding for xenon tetrafluoride. So that leaves one remaining irreducible representation, EU. So let's see how many EUs are included in the reducible representation. So we contain our reduction formula for the irreducible representation EU. We have our one over 16 because there are 16 operations in the point group. The order of the group is 16. Remember that our red values came from our reducible representation characters. The values in purple are the number of operations in the class. And the number in black is the character in the character table for D4H for the particular irreducible representation, which here is EU. So we get four times one times two. We also have a character that's a zero and a character that's a zero. So we have one sixteenth of 8 plus 8, which is 16, which tells us that we have exactly one EU in our reducible representation. That tells us that we're able to reduce the reducible representation for sigma bonding into a linear combination of 1 A1G plus 1 B1G plus 1 EU. Now recall, we know that we have to have four linear combinations. And we might be worried because it looks like we only have three. But recall that EU is a doubly degenerate representation, which means that we're going to be able to get two molecular orbitals from this one irreducible representation. So this counts for two, B1G counts for one, A1G counts for one. So we have exactly four linear combinations, which is what we'd expected. So that's all good. So I thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you again for part two. Have a good one.